Hello everyone, once again I welcome you all to MSP lecture series on transmetallic chemistry. I am sure you are enjoying the classification of ligands by donor atoms. Uh, in my previous lecture, I was telling you about how important it is to make right kind of phosphines so that you can perform catalysis very efficiently under homogeneous catalysis. So, let me continue from where I had stopped. Okay, I was telling you about the choice of catalyst and for catalysis why we prefer bidentate ligands. Even when you have bidentate ligands, why we prefer unsymmetrical bidentate ligands or difunctional ligands having hemilabile nature or of uh, hybrid in nature. So, now uh, let me show you these things I showed you and also I showed you at the advantage of bidentate ligands versus monodentate ligands. Now, I shall try to convince you using these following cartoons why bidentate ligands are much more efficient and have longer life and can yield products with high turnover number and turnover frequency. Let us assume this palladium tetrachystriphenyl phosphine, 4 ligands are there and metal is here and now we have to activate couple of bonds. The moment you put into solution what would happen? 2 bonds would be getting activated as a result what happens? The bond distance also increases that means they are slightly ready for cleavage you can see and also it is activated. So, in the next step they are completely detached, completely detached. You imagine a a father goes with four children to some sort of uh, mela where millions of people are there. In case if he loses two children, it is highly unlikely that they will come back to father, it is highly unlikely that he will it will they will come back to father. And like that if 100 parents are going where a millions of people are gathered, I am sure at least few parents would lose their children, they go empty handed or go with few children in case if they are coming with 4 children with them. This is what happens to tetrachystriphenyl phosphine palladium compound in solution when we are using it as a homogeneous catalyst for a particular organic transformation. So, that means basically regeneration efficiency is very low as a result what happens catalytic cycle, number of catalytic cycle one can perform will decrease. And in case what happens if moisture intervenes, of course, these compounds are highly susceptible for oxidation, phosphines can be readily formed phosphine oxide as a result what happens? If the moisture comes what happens? The entire uh, metal complex is decomposed and you can never get back this one from this condition. So, this is the fate of metal complex having 4 monodentate ligands when you want to use them in homogeneous catalysis. Organic chemists what they do is they use large excess of that one as a result what happens they are not worried about the catalytic efficiency what they want is small quantity of catalytic uh, product there should not be any problem. But if you as an inorganic chemist if you want to use this one uh, in, in very small quantity with efficiency like 1 mole percent 0.5 mole percent I do not think it is an ideal case when if you think about monodentate ligands. So, let us look into bidentate ligand in the same context. Now, you can see the difference between them is these two children are again tied. Now, father knows that it is likely that you know you cannot control all the four together and even if his attention is diverted little bit these two kids can go away as a result what he does is he ties the hands of uh, children like this. In that case what happens in case if he loses the grip on two children they cannot go because their hands are tied with another one which he has a firm grip. As a result what happens these two try to go away but they cannot go away they are in the vicinity of father all and they will try to make bond or try to establish a bond and once oxidative division is over and reductive elimination is also completed they can establish so that father can go happily with 4 children. No matter how many people are gathered it is highly unlikely that he loses children here. This is what exactly one can compare with bidentate ligand in homogeneous catalysis. Due to some reason what happens if it is getting oxidized that means you, you get wounded let us say wounded uh, here it is 
baby or if it is a phosphine getting oxidized to form a PO bond and now PO bond means it is a hard donor atom. Now, P is no longer a donor atom, but oxygen lone pair is can be donated to the metal. Sometimes it happens if you take THF diethyl ether, they can also bind to metals which are soft. So, as a result what happens now? It is no longer a trivalent phosphorus, it is a pentavalent uh, tetra coordinated phosphorus having P double bond O and O has lone pair and then from this one once the reductive elimination is over still we can establish a bond so that he will go with two, two wounded children and then they can be uh, taken care. So now the bond is established here. So that means again you can generate a more active species compared to the parent catalyst and it is much more easy to dissociate these bonds because this is a soft center and these two are hard centers. Dissociation would be very, there is a competition to dissociate this one and this one. You know that these bonds are soft, soft stable and that is what we want. They want to be ancillary ligands, they have to be held on to the metal whereas these two bonds should be cleaved. So that is what exactly happens. Now in the second cycle, if this happens, second cycle even much faster that means some damage that happens to uncoordinated or dangling phosphorus moieties can enhance the catalytic efficiency, something unusual, unheard of, but is yes, true that happens in case of phosphines and this is the advantage of having unsymmetrical phosphines. I am sure now you are convinced why uh, we are very particular about designing appropriate phosphines with appropriate characteristic so that we can use them efficiently and also they can be more durable. When we look into the phosphorus bound metal complexes, their application are plenty and of course when we talk about uh, phosphines, we come across variety of uh, you know groups on phosphorus, they can be phosphanes or also called phosphines, phosphonides, phosphenides and uh, phosphorus nitrogen compounds we have and of course pincer chemistry comes into picture and then in coordination organometallic chemistry they are second to none and coordination polymers, metal clusters and metal cages, phosphines play a major role and of course homogeneous catalysis, they are the leading ligands and of course with uh, less toxic phosphines one can think of them in anti-cancer studies and they can also show interesting photophysical studies and also they can be very handy in material applications. Now we should look into this bond enthalpies and if you see here. Uh, phosphorus to fluorine bonds are quite strong whereas phosphorus to iodine bonds are very weak and of course these compounds are quite expensive and not very easy to handle but on the other hand PCL and PBR bonds can be handled nicely. In fact, uh, uh, PBR3 is also used as a brominating agent in organic chemistry and in the most appropriate and ec economical compounds are phosphorus chlorine compounds that means having 3 chlorine atoms on phosphorus or phosphorus trichloride phosphorus trichloride has optimum properties. One can perform a series of nucleophilic substitution reaction to generate a desired phosphorus compound either by using lithium reagents or Grignard reagents or even Friedel-Crafts reaction for that matter or several other reactions where one can replace chlorine with uh, right kind of substituents to have moderate or desired steric and electronic attributes on it. Now how to replace in my previous lectures when I was talking about several metal complexes I showed you how you can generate labile complexes and eventually replace those with phosphines or the other ligands. For example, if you have astronitrile, benzonitrile, cyclooctadiene or narbornadiene are there, they are very easily replaceable ligands. One can make those compounds as intermediates and then under mild conditions one can generate a phosphine complex whether monophosphine, bisphosphine or even a, a, a phosphorus compound having tridentate properties. So now I will show you how one can replace carbon monoxide using simple condition under mild condition. For example, one can also perform photochemical reaction, you can shine UV light and you can detach or dissociate CO and in its place another phosphorus uh, ligand can come or one can also do thermal reaction by refluxing a, an appropriate uh, metal carbonyl with ligand in a right kind of solvent. But how to do substitution of carbon monoxide with 
phosphine under mild conditions say room temperature where there is an option one can use trimethylamine N oxide. Let me show you this trick. So, let us consider a hexacarbonyl. So, it can be molybdenum or tungsten then treat this one with one equivalent of trimethylamine N oxide. This is also called as TMNO. If somewhere if you read simply TMNO you should understand that it is trimethylamine N oxide and then it forms an intermediate of course, here you should remember it has something like this bond is polarized here. It forms a compound of this type here. So, now we have plus charge and we have negative charge here. Now, what happens it readily loses a molecule of carbon dioxide and a molecule of trimethylamine to generate a vacant site on metal. This is a vacant site now. So, now if we add at this stage a tri a tertiary phosphine we can make very conveniently a phosphine complex something like this. Of course, one can do stepwise. Now, we can add one more equivalent of uh, trimethylamine oxide and we can one substitute for one more carbon monoxide. We can keep on doing and if the phosphine taken is not very bulky and the phosphorus substances are very strong electron withdrawing groups then probably we can replace all carbon monoxide from a hexacarbonyl. Example, if you take trifluorophosphine, this is one such ligand whose sigma donor and pi acceptor abilities can be compared to carbon monoxide. It can knock off all carbon monoxide and one can form a homolyptic complex like this. So, there are not many ligands we have which can replace all CO. Of course, one can also take a nitrogen donor ligand. If you ask a question, take metal hexacarbonyl at trimethylamine N oxide and it generates a vacant site, how about adding ammonia? Yes, you can add ammonia, trithalamine, you can add, you can add astronitril, still you can form. But only thing one should remember is if you want to replace carbon monoxide with nitrogen donor ligands which are only sigma donor, you cannot go beyond 3 you can not go beyond 3 and at most you can get MCO3 L thrice L3 where L can be any nitrogen donor ligands whereas in case of phosphines it is possible. So, this is one mild reaction method where a carbon monoxide can be replaced at room temperature using a solvent such as astronitril or even toluene. Now, in the, the question is, is they remain always ancillary ligands or silent spectators phosphines or is it possible to perform some reactions on coordinated phosphines. Yes, I showed you while talking about orthometallation triphenyl phosphine can undergo orthometallation through CH activation and then it can be added oxidatively and then if the condition is suitable HCl can be eliminated or H if the metal has a halide that can still retain having higher coordination number okay, or higher action state. But if we can perform reaction on coordinated phosphorus, yes it is possible then again we are thinking of an interesting catalytic system. So, let us look into what would happen if we make an attempt to do PC bond cleavage. So, let us consider a, a complex like this. We have some other ligands along with a triphenyl phosphine and hydride. So, if, if we take this one, there can be cleavage of PC bond to generate a rhodium to phenyl bond and now we have a phosphido group is there and this lone pair is intact now and then it can generate a species of this type. So, now let us say we are adding an organic compound it can give something like this. So, this one 
can eventually eliminate triphenylphosphine as a different ligand now, which can eliminate this diphenylphosphine moiety through this coupling reaction. That means, it is possible to activate a PC bond of coordinated tertiary phosphine. Now, what happened earlier we had a phenyl group was there here if you see and now phenyl group has come out and then in its place we have a new moiety here. So, that means, this is uh, this is a typical APC bond cleavage. cleavage and also this is also called as R group reshuffle or R group shuffle. So, this also comes very handy in generating a, a new kind of tertiary phosphines having different substituents on phosphorus. So, another advantage I shall tell you more about uh, this kind of reactions at later stage. In fact, in our own group we have seen PC bond cleavage and also migration of phosphorus bond group onto the metal very interesting chemistry carried out recently. I shall tell you sometime before I conclude phosphorus donor ligands. And another advantage with phosphines is uh, 31 p NMR. So, NMR spectroscopy comes very handy in diagnosing the complexes and nature of the complexes and also reactivity of the complexes because phosphorus depending upon what kind of groups we have and also what is the oxy state whether trivalent phosphorus or pentavalent phosphorus. Uh, they have very distinct chemical shifts that vary that range from plus 250 to minus 300 in general or it can go from plus 600 to minus 600 in special cases or in some cases it can also go from plus 800 to minus 800. And here 31 p NMR nuclear spin is half and it is 100 percent abundant as a result carrying out or performing NMR phosphorus NMR would be very easy. And here we are using 85 percent phosphoric acid as a reference and that uh, chemical shift is considered as 0 whatever comes on the left is called downfield region whatever comes on right region is called upfield region or this is shielded and this is deshielded and uh, low frequency shift and high frequency shift we also call. I shall if time permits I shall introduce uh, interpretive NMR spectroscopy uh, to make you familiar to interpret spectra while characterizing metal complexes when we have nuclear active species in it. I shall try to do that at the end and now just you can see here when you have different substituents they have very distinct chemical shifts. For example, trichlorophosphorus or phosphorus trichloride appears 220 ppm whereas when you start replacing chlorides what happens it will be more shielded and when it comes here it is more shielded and appears at 36. And as I mentioned phosphoric acid zero reference and then when you have this one minus 2 is there triphenylphosphine minus 6 like that what happens they have a distinct chemical shifts are there. When you react a metal complex with phosphine whether the metal complex has formed or not or if we have any unreacted phosphine or whether it is decomposed where it is oxidized all this information comes simply by looking into 31 pnmr of the species. So, this is where it comes very handy in diagnosing the reactions and reaction sequences and also sometimes one can also perform kinetics using 31 pnmr spectroscopy. Okay. So, now I will show you a uh, very interesting feature here. Uh, for example, when we have four membered ring okay, this is a bisphosphine having one methylene group is there and it is a DPPM bis diphenyl phosphine methane we have, bis diphenyl phosphine ethane we have, bis diphenyl phosphine of propane we have. So, all of them are forming four membered or five membered or six membered rings and then we again chelate ring size also has influence on chemical shift. That means, uh, electron density around the phosphorus can also vary. Okay, with the ring size. Okay. So, that means that also sometime assist us in understanding the reaction sequence and also how much electron density resides on phosphorus and all those things uh, all those things. For example, now if you look into this uh, chelate complex and let us say in, in case of DPPM if you want to imagine two simple uh, mononitrate ligands the best would be having. So, we have methylene group is there. So, the best 
magnetic ligands that come very close to the property of bidentate ligand or methyl diphenyl phosphine. Okay, for example, it is here. Okay, this one is more or less comparable uh, to two uh, donor atoms present in these three uh, chelate rings. Uh, and now, what uh, <coughs> I have done here is to show you chemical shift for uh, these metal complexes here. Okay, and then plus or minus charge indicates the shielded or deshielded. <coughs> So, th this, this is for the complex and this is for the free ligand DPPM and similarly this is for DPP and this is for DPP and this is for the free ligand here. And then the difference, what is this? Uh, this is called coordination shift. Coordination shift is nothing but the difference in the chemical shift between free ligand and complex. Okay. So, that one is given here. What is this one? This is called coordination shift of a chelate complex. So, here this value also give you some information. This is con taken by considering this value from this one. Okay. For example, if you take this value here and, and then the difference would come here in, in the ligand chemical shift and this one should give you this one. Okay. Now, we can see DPPO is more shielded and DPPA de shielded and again this is shielded and this one is shielded. So, that means some information it gives. Okay. So, that information we can effectively use in analyzing some of these reactions and also to understand the nature of donor properties and also the stability and all those things. Let us okay, try to do these things as and when okay, we get such uh, okay, uh, opportunities. Okay. Now, uh, just I would show you uh, the donor and acceptor properties of phosphines uh, how one can analyze or how they can impact the bond parameters. Okay. I have taken two examples here uh, with cobalt having one CP group okay, cyclopentadienyl and two triethyl phosphines one is uh, positive okay, and one is neutral. Okay. So, okay. so, that means here we are taken a cobalt 1 and here we are taken a cobalt 2 and now similarly in iron case also we have taken one neutral okay and then one had taken so that means one one a, a positive one and a neutral that means in this one electron density is less and here electron density is more okay now let's look into the metal to uh, cobalt to phosphorus bond cobalt to phosphorus bond distance is 2.218 angstrom units here in this one whereas in this one it is 2.230 okay 2.230 that means okay the bond is little bit elongated why it is elongated? There is less back bonding from cobalt to phosphorus because it already electron deficient. So, that means this one certainly gives a hint that yes, there is back bonding is there and back bonding can strengthen metal to phosphorus bond. The way we see in case of metal carbonates where excessive back bonding from metal to carbon monoxide okay, increases the strength of metal to carbon bond and decreases its length and also CO bond length is increased or it is elongated. Okay, so in the same context, you can also compare here. Okay, in this one, bond is little shorter, whereas here little longer because CO is not a very good donor here because of positive charge. Same thing one can see here. Okay, in iron compound, okay, 2.146 and 2.261. So that means again here, iron because of one electron less, it is a weak pi donor. And then how that impacts? Of course, here what happens if the back bonding is more okay, metal to phosphorus bond is strengthened. On the other hand, what would happen to uh, phosphorus to carbon bond? Okay, you can see here. In this one, it is 1.846 here, 1.846. So, that means bond is getting elongated. Okay, PC bond is getting elongated. Of course, that should happen. I will show you later. Uh, and then here, Okay, the bond not much back bonding is there as a result what happens? The bond okay, PC bond is little stronger here okay, 1.829. So, that means the impact has not only alters metal to phosphorus bond, but also dramatically it alters metal to carbon bond also that can be seen here. Okay. 
uh, in, in extreme cases what happens one can think of cleaving PC bond this is what exactly happens I showed you in my previous slide. Okay. So, same thing analysis you can make it that means uh, okay, if we have careful analytical observation we can see all those things and we can understand the properties in a much better way. Okay. Okay, like this. Okay. For example, we take when, when excessive back bonding is there and, and that means more and more electrons go to the sick monster as a result what happens this R group can come out as a carbon anion and then it will carry a positive charge. If that happens whether we can use this moiety okay, in a catalytic manner for as an alkylating agent. Okay, yes, we can do it no one has done so far, but if you want to do it we have to see how again we can bring back another alkyl group here. If we can catalytically uh, using a suitable reagent, if we can furnish again uh, formation of PR bond, yes we can use this one very interestingly as an alkylating agent. Okay. Okay, let me stop uh, uh, at this juncture and continue talking or uh, discussing interesting uh, phosphorus uh, chemistry in my next lecture. Until then, enjoy reading phosphorus chemistry.